why is it important to live a life to make your family proud? I think it's very important to live life and make your family proud because this is the next generation. It's important for my for my mom and dad to be proud because they know that they've done a good job by parenting me and I grew up to be what I am today. Happy life, happy wife, happy family. That's the way it works, right? Show them the right the right direction, give them direction. To um, show them how to be kind, how to love the fellow man. Well, for my daughter, I want her to be proud of me in a way that if she's a mother one day, she raises her child to be proud of her and, you know, generational. All right. Hey. Hey. I have no idea where that came from, but we're the old Fonzie days, maybe, for those of you who are happy. Uh, if you need a copy of the notes, raise your hand. Glad to see you here today. Glad to see uh, you in Victorville. I don't get to see the folks over in Apple Valley and Phelan and Hesperia when we're here teaching, but we know they're with us and appreciate their joining us for this part of the service each weekend. Keep your hand up if you need a copy of the outline. This is uh, going to be a, a different kind of message, I guess. Uh, we're going to become more intentional about our intrusion into your personal lives. <laughs> so it is a, uh, a passage, uh, last part of chapter 5 we'll be looking at. Actually, the text for the week gets us into chapter 6, but we just have time for what we're going to share about husbands and wives in... Uh, in this part of chapter 5, the last part of chapter 5. It's all about being a part of God's family, this series on um, being in God's oikos, being part of his household, uh, coming out of Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, is a reminder that there are implications for being a child of God. We are connected to the Father. And that connection to the Father that we have in our lives, uh, all of us have in our lives, is, no, is not seen more anywhere than it is seen at home in our relationship with our spouse. Let me just say right off top that some of you aren't married, so you might find it easy to tune out today. You might want to leave, actually. Um, <laughs> but that would be silly because if you're single and... A very healthy percentage of our church family is single. The chances are, though, that you won't be single for your whole life. And statistically, even those of you who are, are, are not even thinking about getting married, you haven't even had a first date yet, you're just a young person sitting in one of these rooms uh, today, and you may be wondering why this is for you. Oh, baby, if you can figure this out before you even start that journey. This will help you tons. Many of you are in a relationship, a marriage relationship now, and you're experiencing a significant amount of dysfunction, and today you're going to recognize why that is. So I don't know what to tell you, except listen. All of you listen very carefully. Uh, we are part of God's family. We're not outsiders. We're insiders. That's what Ephesians 2, 19 continues to remind us each weekend. We now have the opportunity in being a part of God's oikos, his family, his household, we now have responsibilities and we have privileges. And, and so we're looking at some of those privileges throughout uh, the series and today specifically in the marriage relationship. Last time, in the middle of chapter 5, we talked uh, about the idea of being filled with the Spirit. It is no coincidence, in my opinion, that the whole... Uh, part or discussion of being filled with the Spirit then is followed up with this discussion of your immediate family relationships, first and foremost, the relationship that you share with your spouse. See, if anything else is controlling you except for the Holy Spirit, then your family's in trouble. The best thing you can do for your marriage is to simply give control of your life to God. Because once the Holy Spirit fills your life, now these ideas about marriage become a pathway 
to success. Until the Holy Spirit has filled your life, you will push back significantly on what I'm going to say today because you have listened more to the culture than you have to the Spirit of God. The world will look at you sideways if you tell them what I'm going to tell you today. I'm not talking to the world today. Now, there are times I do. But right now, I'm speaking to God's family who have given their lives to Jesus have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and so the idea of submission, authority, headship is not something that we push back on intellectually and emotionally. It's something that we embrace because we recognize that God has our best interest at heart. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ is what we read in verse 21. And this begins a long section, in fact, one of the hallmark sections in the New Testament on what submission looks like and specifically here in a family. Uh, let me just read the passage through the end of chapter five because I want you to listen to this. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians five. Uh, verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then verse 22, my favorite verse in the entire scripture. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Can we just close in prayer and just <laughs> call it a day? I told Cheryl, I said, baby, look, could you come to all the services this weekend? <laughs> all right, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body is the church of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives must submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, that's all we're going to get to today, but man, that's a, that's a boatload, isn't it? You know, you read that, and some of you, especially you ladies, you're looking at that, and you're thinking, this is so chauvinistic. This is so like old school. This is so like yesterday. This is not... Progressive. It's not what our culture is telling us. And once again, if you watch TV more than you read the Bible, you're going to believe TV more than you believe the Bible. And that's why you're pushing back. Because you just don't know what the Bible says and, and what God wants us to get. I want you to understand this. You see, this whole idea of authority is key. And, um, and authority in the family is where, you know, the proverbial rubber meets the road. Look at the the submission, the idea of submission. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why do you submit at home? Because Jesus is that important to you. That's all. You know, I could talk to you wives and you say, well, my husband doesn't deserve it. It's not the point. You don't submit to a husband because he, he deserves it. That's kind of funny. <laughs> you submit because Jesus is that important to you. You submit out of reverence, you revere, you highly regard Jesus. That's why we're having this conversation. Not because of, what's his name? But because of the greatest name of all. And that's Jesus. But that's a mission that you bring to bear. It has to be motivated by love, not by fear. When you submit out of love, you're allowing the Holy Spirit to control your life. When you submit out of fear, you're allowing other people to control your life. Don't allow other people to control you. See, that's why it's important to get this, be filled, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. That way other people, this is not a control conversation. Some of you fight for control at home. It's your problem. You're submitting out of... The, the desire to be powerful. 
uh, or expecting your wife to submit, and it's a power-based relationship that you have at home, and we'll see the difference between that and an authority-based relationship today. Others control us when we feel as if we owe them something. You can fill in some blanks. This is so important, you guys. You cannot submit because you're afraid that if you don't submit, you won't be loved. If that's the reason you submit, ladies, if that's why you would submit to your husband because he will stop loving you, you're submitting out of fear. And, and that, that doesn't work. And, and it's exhausting, my goodness. This does not last a long time. When you submit to others because you're afraid they'll stop loving you, you know what that's called? That's called exhausting because you're always on stage. You're always performing. You're afraid if you stop performing, they'll stop loving. And nobody wants that, right? Others control us when we feel as if they owe us something. You know, they owe, you owe me. You know what? If I expect something out of you, you're controlling me. And God says, don't let people control you like that. Your expectations are just, they're ruining you. Control is the ability to get what you want. And people want certain things out of a relationship and they fight to get them. I think that most people are unhappy in a relationship because they're just, just ticked off because they haven't gotten what they thought they should. You didn't give me what I was supposed to get out of the relationship. So now, now I'm, I'm mad at you. And, and, and now you're mad at them. Watch well, this. But they're controlling you through your expectations that, that you had for them. See, when you focus on what people have not done for you, you're, you're giving them too much power. There's a story in Matthew 18, we won't look at it today much, but I'll just give you the essence of it. This employer canceled a debt for one of his employees, and the debt was around $10 million in our economic terms. Just canceled it. The irony of it all is that the combined taxable income of the entire five-province territory where Jesus was speaking that day was about 800000 So $10 million, you know, when he threw that number on the table... You know, everybody in that audience went, whoa, that's a lot of cash. Well, this, this, this employer cancels the debt of the employee at, at $10 million. And then that same employee went out and refused to cancel a debt incurred by one of his fellow employees. And that debt was about 20 bucks. So he accepted you know, that his debt was canceled at a $10 million level, wouldn't cancel the debt of somebody who had, had owed him 20 bucks. And the point of the story is that God paid off your 10 million, so don't go after that guy's 20 bucks. It's a very simple um, lesson out of the story. Don't let that guy control you that way. <laughs> it's not worth it. And the thing is, if you let somebody else control you, then guess who isn't controlling you? The Holy Spirit, because watch this, control cannot be shared. If two people are in control, nobody's in control. Control can be exchanged, and that's the challenge. Give the Holy Spirit control. You're letting other people control you. Don't do that. Let the Holy Spirit of God control you. Things will work out much better. In, in 1980, some of you aren't even old, old enough to remember 1980 because you were born after 1981. But anyway, in 1980 the entire country was focused on two very historical events. And those events were taking place simultaneously. One of those events took place on the Capitol steps in Washington, D.C., where Ronald Reagan was becoming the president of the United States. His inauguration was taking place on the Capitol steps, and you've seen that on TV perhaps during one, at least one of those, those big, you know, celebrations and you know all the dignitaries and the bands are playing and the speakers and you've got the Capitol Mall filled with all of the well-wishers and the flags. It's quite a spectacle. And so while Ronald Reagan was being given the oath of office to become the president of the United States, half a world away, the Iranian government was in the process of releasing 52 American hostages that they had held captive for 444 days. It was called the Iranian hostage crisis. Well, during the inaugural festivities, the president who was going out, Jimmy Carter, his press secretary was a guy named Jody Powell. 
And Jody Powell was asked to call the State Department to get an update on the hostages. And so he went backstage while the inauguration was taking place. And he got on the phone. But in the time it took him to go back and get the State Department on the phone, Ronald Reagan had completed the oath of office and was officially the president. So Jody Powell, Jimmy Carter's press secretary, to the State Department, I'd like an update on the hostages. The State Department back to Mr. Powell, I'm sorry, Mr. Powell, but you no longer have clearance for that information. That fast. And control was what? Exchanged. But not for one moment do two administrations share power at the same time. You see, it's important that you recognize <laughs> what it means to give people control. We're not talking about control. We're talking about authority. This passage separates, actually, the mediocre marriages from the set-apart marriages, the average run-of-the-mill Christian marriage from the holy marriage. And I want you to give up on the mediocre. I want you to embrace the set-apart, the holy marriage. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Okay, we're talking about head, the head of the wife. Christ is the head of the church. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the same apostle, Paul, writing on the same subject, told the Corinthians, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, head of Christ is God. Head, head, head. That's three heads in one verse. So this is all about authority based on headship. Our functional model for marriage is the Godhead. If you want to understand what your marriage ought to look like, you got to study the Godhead. you got to understand how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all operate together. Because we are that connected to them. We talk about connected as the theme of this series. We're connected to our Father so inextricably that even our marriage relationship depends on our understanding how they get along. If you are a wife, and by the way, we're not talking about women submitting to men, we're talking about wives submitting to husbands. That's a whole different conversation. If you're a wife and you say today, I don't want to submit to my husband, then you don't want to be like Jesus because he submitted to the Father. That's the template for your relationship at home. Jesus was God's equal, but functionally, he submitted to the Father. That's the example you follow. You're your husband's equal. But functionally, you submit to your husband. The wife, the wife who says that they don't want to submit to their husband is essentially saying, I'm better than Jesus. No, I don't think that's what you're saying, because if you said that, you'd be an idiot. You can't say you're better than Jesus. Nobody in this room would say they're better than Jesus. But that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to communicate. You recognize what you in your marriage represents as it relates to the relationship that the Father and the Son share. You cannot deny the need to live under the authority of a husband because you're not better than Jesus. That's it. Now, this might sound like harsh subordination, but when you understand the big picture, it's really quite the opposite. Let me show you what authority looks like. Authority cannot be taken. It can only be given. You don't take authority over people. You can take power over people. All you need is a magnum. You know, all you need is a gun. I could pull a gun on you and I could take power over you. But that power only lasts as long as I got ammunition. That power is short-lived. Now, this is the way the world operates. The world operates by one individual taking power over another one. Some of you are in a marriage relationship right now and you got a power struggle. That's why it'll never work. Because you cannot run your marriage like the world runs itself. The world is, is so dysfunctional and broken. You don't want your marriage to reflect that. See, you're giving up on mediocrity. So now what you want is not a power-based relationship. You want an authority-based relationship. And whereas you might have been trying to take power over your spouse, now what I want you to do is simply to think of your influence in light of authority. Authority is something that can only be given. Ladies, your, 
You're grown-ups. You don't have to do this. If you had to do it, we'd be talking power. You don't have to do this. In fact, our culture will applaud you a thousand different ways if you say you will not, you will, <laughs> you will not give authority to your husband because the world would tell you that's silly. But God tells you to because he knows it's not silly. But anyway, my point is that your husband has no authority over you unless you give it to him. Who has the power now? You can decide not to give your husband authority. Your husband could never stand up and say, I take authority over thee. <laughs> what have you been smoking, bro? <laughs> that doesn't work. It never works. If he has any authority, you have to give it to him. It's like raising kids. When, when your kids are young, you have power. It's a power-based relationship. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, we, we raised three young kids. They were half our size. They had no money. <laughs> they had, they had, unless I let them in the house, they had no place to live. When they got older, they had no cars. They had no keys to the car unless I gave them the key to the car. You know what that means? It means I had power. It was so great in that power phase of our relationship with our children. Now they're bigger than us. Or they got more money than us. They, they live in their own houses. What do we got? We got nothing. <laughs> Except that early on, Cheryl and I learned that the only way to have a long-lasting, successful relationship with our children was not to make our relationship based on power, but based on authority. And if I would ever have authority in my children's lives, what would they have to do? Give it to me or else I don't get it. You can't go into your grown kids' lives and say, I still have authority over you. Not if they don't give it to you, you don't. Which is why I have to tell you, I just have to admit, it's kind of nice. When they call and ask for advice, when they still want to know what dad thinks, when they still look to dad as an example, as a patriarch, they don't need me, but they want me. Why? I have no power. But I have authority. <laughs> and they gave it to me. Now, I had to do certain things in order for them to want to. But that's the point of this whole thing, ladies. We, we talk, you have the power to give authority to your husband. Do it. Now, let's, let's lean on him for a little bit. Uh, poor boy. Our view of headship would not have been held by first century Ephesians. We talk about headship. We talk about a guy who makes all the calls. You know, is like an NFL quarterback. He's calling the signals. Everybody runs the play according to the, the playbook that he has designed for the family, right? That's, that's headship in our culture. But kafale in the Greek, which is the word that is translated, you know, head, head, head in 1 Corinthians eleven three, you know, three times in one verse. It refers, it doesn't refer to a dictator. It doesn't refer to somebody who's, who's, who's domineering at all. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament does that word look that way. Every time it shows up, it refers to a source, an origin, or a starting point. God is starting with you. You determine the trajectory of your family. It all begins with you, which is why he holds you responsible. Do you ever notice why or notice how? We'll talk about why in a minute because it's speculation. But do you, do you notice how God did not hold Eve responsible for the fall in the Garden of Eden, even though she's the one who sinned first? And God held Adam responsible because he was the source, the origin, and the starting point. It all began with him. And I'm saying to you, gentlemen, you take ownership of this role as the head of your home because the future trajectory of your family depends on how seriously you take this. I am like so much harder on you. We talk all day about it. I mean, I love it. Talk about wives submit to their husbands. I love that because I'm a husband. You talk about being the head of your family. Well, you better sit down and cool your jets, son, because that is a whole different level of responsibility. See, the husband is also under authority, only he's under the authority of Jesus. That's why being filled with the Holy Spirit is so important for this to work. 
My role as a husband is to love Cheryl, my wife, as Christ loved the church. Jesus is my example. I got to be Jesus in this relationship. Talk about pressure, responsibility. I remember, um, you know, obviously we've been married a long time. I remember all 35 years, and we've certainly gone through phases of efficiency and phases that were more dysfunctional in those 35 years. Cheryl was telling me yesterday, we were talking about this message before I gave it the first time, and uh, she said, you know, I remember when I decided that it was okay not to be the head of the house because God was going to hold you responsible for the decisions that you made on behalf of our family. <laughs> she would tell you that was very freeing for her because she just said, hey, you make the call, man, it's your problem. <laughs> you know, you're the one that's going to be held to account. You're the one someday that God's going to bring up in front of the judgment seat of Christ and say, what were you thinking? See, God held Adam responsible in the garden. God holds Tom responsible in the Mercer family. So it, it's, it, if you want to stand up and say, I'm the head of the house, you might want to think about that. And be careful what you ask for, boys. You might just get it. And with privilege comes responsibility, and this responsibility is incredibly great. I tell guys all the time when I'm performing marriage ceremonies, I say, God loves this girl more than you ever will. Do not screw this up because it is important to him. She is that highly valued to Jesus. Headship, man, that is a load to carry. And, and we can do it. How, how can we do this? I haven't even told you what you gotta do. How can we do this if we are continually being filled by the Spirit of God? Otherwise, we're a train wreck. Let me give you eight ideas about headship. And I'm gonna show you in the passage we just read to the end of chapter five, how they all relate to a husband being the head of the wife. But before we do that, since Jesus is our example as husbands, I wanna show you how all eight of those line up in respect to how Jesus is the head of the church. Because if we wanna understand how we're supposed to act at home, we gotta understand how Jesus acts as a member of the Godhead and how he... Uh, operates as the head of the church. Okay, here we go. H-E-A-D-S-H-I-P, okay? Let's go. H, humility. Humility. When Jesus came, you would have expected a grand coronation with all the trappings of power, establishing his supremacy from the very beginning. But that's not how Jesus came. When Jesus came to establish his church, how did he come? As a baby in a manger. You talk about humble beginnings. And living a humble life. He lived as a carpenter from one of the least acclaimed regions in Israel, Nazareth. You remember that line? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What was the inference? Like, no. Humility. If the world had orchestrated the arrival of the Messiah, it would have looked a lot different. The E is empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Jesus doesn't feel sorry for us. When Jesus came, he felt sorry like us. One of the most cryptic statements in the New Testament, I wish I could unpack it in a way that made sense to you, but I don't even understand it myself. Jesus is on the cross, and at three in the afternoon, he cries out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Watch what happened on the cross. There was a break in the Godhead. The Father and the Son were no longer Compatible. Why? Why did the son become so despised by the father? Because on the cross, Jesus actually became our sin. And the father had to turn away. When Jesus came, he didn't just humble himself and become a man. He became our sin. Why? So he could feel what it was like to be despised by God himself. He dove in headfirst into humankind. Empathy. Abandonment, A, abandonment. In order to put himself in our shoes, he had to abandon his comfort zone. I mean, there must have been something comfortable about being God. 
But he abandoned that to come down here. Determination. There's a sense of determination. You know this. You've read the Gospels. The obstacles the enemy threw in Jesus' way to keep him from fulfilling his mission. And yet Jesus so efficiently negotiated every one of those obstacles. If Jesus was going to be successful in his mission, it would not require an effort. It would require a determined effort. The cross itself is symbolic of the greatest obstacle of all. And Jesus completed it. Determination. Sanctification. Sanctification. The word sanctified means set apart. Set apart as holy unto God. Jesus came to provide us an opportunity to be set apart as holy. And that's what the church is. We are the Haggioi, the saints. Remember that? We talked about that in Ephesians 1. We've been set apart, sanctified. He has reconciled you, Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death on the cross to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. God's goal is to take you and I, his family, his children, his body, his church, his bride, and present us holy before his Father. Harmony, H. No division in the church. Why? Because Jesus made sure that we could live harmoniously. There's no division in the body. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 25. It's parts, you and I, have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. One part's honored, every part rejoices with it. You're the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. Each one of us are a part of it. Jesus gave us this team relationship. And we need to understand what our roles are. Our roles are different. Your role at, at church is different than my role at church. But we all depend on one another for the corporate efficiency of the body of Christ to have an impact in our culture. We have a harmonious and therefore a successful church experience. That's what Jesus desires for his church. Jesus is the head of a harmonious church. The I is the word illustration. He's our illustration of what God is like. Jesus Christ displays God's immense patience as a what? As an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Jesus is our example. In fact, he is the illustration God gave us about what God is like. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Jesus gives us the greatest illustration of a life lived rightly. God drew us a picture of himself. And that picture was Jesus. P is personal interest. As selfless as God's efforts were in bringing us to himself in executing this plan of redemption, there was a high level of personal benefit involved as well. We're not the only ones who functionally benefit from our being saved from our sin. We can never forget that we are eternally loved by God. Our salvation is first and foremost a benefit to God. Remember all the way back in chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. In love God predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his what? His pleasure and his will. This is what God wanted because there was personal benefit for him. His love for us was so deep, he could hardly wait for us to be reconciled. Now that's the model for us as husbands. Now the comparison of anyone's role to that of our Savior is bound to break down at some point because we're like morons. But there are parallels that Paul wants to draw for us as husbands as we come to our families, as we come to our wives, we can now look at the same sequence that Jesus executed so beautifully in, in regard to his church. Now our job is to provide that kind of headship for our wife. Number one, humility. Humility. This is a profound mystery, he says. Can you imagine how revolutionary this whole idea of mutual submission and love and, and headship that involved humility. Can you imagine how revolutionary that message was in a Roman environment? I mean, the Romans were not known for their, their humility. 
They were known for their power, for their control. This is an unearthly way to lead a family. In fact, our culture will tell you the same thing. If you want to be a man, you have to take power, which you can do. But if you want to be God's man, you have to provide the kind of headship that will cause her to give you authority. And that's a whole different Dr. Phil, I'll tell you that. <laughs> e is the word empathy. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself. In order to fulfill your mission, you're going to have to put yourself in her shoes. Now, I know that's impossible to do any more than it's possible for her to put herself in your shoes. But you got to try. You got to try to see life from her vantage point. You come home from your day, you're busy, you're tired. What do you think she is? Some of you guys have her running the family as well as working a job. You ever stop to think about how difficult that might be? Let's reverse the roles. So you both come home from work, it's your responsibility to put food on the table, take care of the kids, bathe the children, get them ready for bed, while she watches Lifetime on TV, much like you like to watch the NFL on TV. Let's just reverse the roles. And how are you digging it now, son? We call that empathy. Try to see life from the other point of view. Abandonment. In order to put yourself in her shoes, you're going to have to abandon your comfort zone like Jesus abandoned his. You're going to have to be willing to engage new and bizarre experiences like sharing your feelings. <laughs> I don't know, that's kind of a weird thought right there. There are things now. You have become a family man, and it's time to be a man. You're not a boy any longer, and I'm not talking about your chronological age because you probably were a boy much longer than, you know, you're physically you matured into manhood, but emotionally, mentally, so often guys remain in boyhood and they play games like boys do. And their pastimes are all about what boys do. Not about what men do. You got to abandon stuff. Jesus had to abandon things that he, he enjoyed before he became a man to be for the church what the church needed him to be. Same thing's true for your family, guys. There are a lot of things bachelors get to do. And I'm talking about even morally upright bachelors. I'm not talking about all the weird stuff that we think of when we think of what bachelors do. Bachelors do what bachelors do. They don't have to take care of a family. Now that you're not a bachelor anymore, now you have to abandon that mindset. Your time and energy levels are limited. You may have been busy before you took on a family, but now that you have, you've got to let some things go in order to embrace your new life as a head of a family. That's all I'm saying. I don't even, I don't even know what they're going to be. I don't even care. But they're going to be something. I, I could ask you this question. What did you abandon when you became a family man, when you took on a spouse, when you became a husband? What did you abandon? What do you not long, no longer do that you used to enjoy? And, and a lot of husbands, no, I'm still doing all the same stuff. And that's why, that's why you got the issues you have. Being a husband, being the head of a house means that you abandon your former life. You empty yourself. That's what Jesus did. He did not consider being equal with God, something to be held on to. That's what Paul said to the Philippian church. He emptied himself. What have you emptied yourself of? Determination. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Those words, feed and care, are very key, and it shows a level of determination that few guys have, which is why most guys have mediocre marriages. Jesus had obstacles in his way. You do too. Got to figure them out. And the first thing you need to figure out is your wife. The words feed and care are interesting. The word feed is a Greek term. It means to bring, introduced by the Greek prefix, which causes it to literally mean to bring out. You need to bring out what God has put inside that girl. And then you care for it. 
That word care is used only one other time in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 2.7, this is what it says. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children. In order to care for your wife, you have to see yourself as a nursing mother caring for her children. The word means to warm or to heat, hence that visual that you see there. So this is the challenge for guys. What's God placed in your wife's life in terms of passions, strengths, gifts, hopes, aspirations? What does God want to accomplish in her? You've got to bring that out and feed it. It didn't take me very long when Cheryl and I got married to recognize that her calling was to be a homemaker. She is the world's greatest homemaker. And I don't know you, most all of you I don't know, so obviously I can't make that determination. I've never seen anything like her. As a mom and now as a grandmother, my goodness, she's off the charts. If I would have sent her to work, I would have snuffed out what God had put inside of her. And so I didn't. We could have used her paycheck, but we didn't get it. And I was a pastor of a small church and got paid very little. And I didn't make all the right decisions. She could tell you about those too, which is why I didn't invite her to share today. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the best decision I ever made was to say to her, God put in your heart the love for a family, and that's your job, girl. What can I do to make you great at it? And God may have placed something else in your wife's life, but until you figure out what it is, you can't bring it out, and you can't warm it up and heat it. You can't bring her to life. Oh, man, headship is hard. Sanctification, to make her holy, cleansing her, by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. What does Jesus want to do for his church? To present us to his father and say, this is my bride. What does, what does God want me to do to be able to say to him someday? And I don't even think necessarily Cheryl and I are going to show up at the judgment seat together. I, I don't even know. But if we did, man, I just... Here you go, Lord. This is what I did. I set her apart for you and for your purpose in her life. Harmony. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ says the church. We're members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. United. Proskalao is a Greek word. It means cemented together. When you became husband and wife, you were cemented together. Okay. Now, sometimes people think, I better get a divorce, and you know, we came together and we'll just separate. Now, you understand what the language tells us. We're cemented together. When you put cement together, how are you going to separate it? With a jackhammer, how are you going to separate it? And what happens when you use a jackhammer to separate cement? Splinters, uh, rocks, boulders, dust, ugly, ugly, ugly mess. That's how you separate cement. You can say, okay, we'll just separate. That's why you're together. That's why harmony is so key. That's why this can't be a power struggle. That's why we need to give authority. And when you're given authority, and not even if you're given or when you're given, because you also revere Christ as Lord, what are you going to do, son? What you're going to do is be the kind of head over that clan that God has given you to lead, just like Jesus is the head of the church. You're a team. Harmony is possible, but not if you do it according to the rules of the culture. So this is a mystery. This is so funny. You know, people, ladies, you look at this and you say, oh, man, this is so weird. 
I've just learned ever since I was a young girl to just, you know, be in charge, be, be you know, empowered women. Man, the way you empower womanhood is to just live your life the way God has designed you, especially in your relationship at home. Illustration. Back to the guys, though. Illustration. Uh, you know, Jesus was the illustration of God for us. Well, I know what God looks like. Look at Jesus. This is the thing. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You are now the illustration in the same way that Jesus is the picture of God. You're the picture of Jesus. That's why I tell Cheryl, I said, man, all you got to be is a church. I got to be Jesus. <sighs> what kind of illustration are you? You know, I think about, you know, our grandkids, young kids, they draw pictures for pops all the time. I don't even know what they are most of the time. And so we're real subtle, right? Because we want to hurt anybody's feelings. Oh, you drew Bob as a picture. Well, what? What do we have here? What did you draw a picture of? Because I have no idea. And they look at me like, can't you tell? Here are four pictures. Look at this. This is great. There four pictures. Three of these pictures are of balloons, and one is a penguin. So which one, just in your mind right now, think about which one you think is the penguin, okay? Because we're on the honor system here. We're going to find out how many of you are right. Okay, show us the penguin. <laughs> Raise your hand if you guessed that penguin. Props to you. The rest of you are thinking, that can't be a penguin. You know, that's what a lot of wives think when they look at their husbands and say, that can't be what Jesus is like. You know what the question is for you at home, gentlemen? Do you look more like Jesus or a penguin? I guess that's the only question I have. Say, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're illustrating Jesus for our wives and they get confused. You know, the, the example of a husband, a dad is so powerful. Statistically, this is so amazing to me. If a mother is the first to become a Christian in a family, there's a 17, 17% probability that the rest of the family will become Christ followers. If a father is the first, remember the source, the origin, the first to lead, the father is the first to become a Christian in their family. You know what the probability the rest of the family will follow suit? 93%. You know why? Because you're the head of the home. Why do you read in the New Testament all the time? A guy comes to faith and his entire oikos place their faith in God. Why? That's why. Because the role you have is so incredibly important. I know, I've almost worn you guys out. Just one more thing, personal interest. This could be a little bit of encouragement to you. Uh, he who loves his wife loves himself. See, there is some personal interest here. Guys, I will tell you this. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, including you. But if mama happy, oh, daddy very happy too, see. <laughs> There's something, there's something going on here. There's a spiritual dynamic here. And I'm, all I'm saying is that she's not the only one that's going to benefit from you being filled with the Spirit of God and being the kind of uh, kafale, the kind of head of that home that your family needs. You know, one of the things I, I'm, I'm going to be done here real quick. One of the things I laugh at is the whole idea of you being our ladies, you being our helper. You know, that's in Genesis, in that whole creation narrative, when, when God said, I have to create a helper that is suitable for him. And what does the world do? The world twists that up and makes you seem like if you think of yourself in that light, you're just a, a, a subordinate, you're, a, you're a, a, a lesser important, you're just like, you know, we got Santa Claus and his elf, and you know, it's, they put all, these, all this imagery in your head like you're a loser. Let me just tell you what that means. Don't overthink what it means to be a helper. God creates your husband. Look at your husband right now. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him right now. If you're with him. If you're not with him, think about him right now. If you're not married, just think about what he's going to look like someday. <laughs> okay? You look at your husband. This is when God said he's going to make Eve as a helper. The reason he did that, look at your husband. The boy needs help. So this is not, don't overanalyze here. Who better, who is better prepared right now? 
Who knows him well enough? Who knows his failures, his strengths, what he can be on his best day, what he's like on his worst day? Who knows that better than you? Nobody is better equipped to help him than you are. So help him. Don't fight him. And Lord, I pray that we would do this. I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for my wife and what she, Lord, what that girl has done for me. And I pray for myself. I pray for all my guys today, but I pray for myself that I would be you in her life. Um, and I pray that, that these girls today, these wives, would see themselves as so empowered to give authority to their husband, to help him become this, the head of, of this house, and, and as, as all of us are called to do this, none of us are very good at it. So, Father, over time, would you allow us success? As we are faithful, as we hang in there, as we allow year after year to pass, even decade after decade, and become the, the marriage picture of your love for people, your love for your church the picture that our oikos needs to see so clearly. Let us be that. Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed. Some of you are, are not believers in Christ. You are still outsiders looking in. I invite you in. Jesus invites you in today to become a part of his family and to realize a whole new level of empowerment and functionality versus dysfunctionality. And I would encourage you, I'd invite you to ABC, admit, believe, choose, admit that you're a sinner and you need help. Believe that Jesus alone can help you. He alone can help you. And choose to place your faith. You, you could pray this prayer right now. Lord, I choose to give you my life. I give you control of my life. I'm not in control. I don't want to be in control anymore. I want you to. I'll follow you. You lead me. Save me and lead me. Be my savior and my leader as of right now. In Jesus' name. All God's children said, okay, if you're up for more, we got it next week. But leave us your welcome form on the, uh, in the basket. We'll see you next time.